Welcome to Three Tiny Questions. Three Tiny Questions with Marcus Collins, Michigan professor and best-selling author of For the Culture. Welcome to Three Tiny Questions, the podcast where we, three tiny partners here, ask the leading minds in marketing one question each about brands, culture, or whatever else comes to mind in an effort to make those of us in advertising do our jobs just a little bit better and make us a little bit smarter. I'm Mike Rovner, partner at Tiny, an ad agency devoted to making great work with great clients and having a great time doing it. And with me, as always, are my partners, Tom Chrisman and Michael Stupak. Hello. How's it going? Today, we're joined by Dr. Marcus Collins. My good friend, Marcus's career spans, big breath, being a marketing manager at iTunes to leading digital strategy for the Queen Bay herself, creating the social practice at Translation, that being the head of strategy at Wyden, New York, teaching at places like Miami Ad School, NYU, Hyper Island, being a professor at Michigan's Stephen M. Ross. Do I have that? Stephen M. Ross School of Business. And he's also the author of bestseller, award-winning, For the Culture. Please welcome Dr. Marcus Collins, For the Culture, also available wherever you buy books. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Michael, Tom, Michael. This is great. I, I'm very, very grateful to be here. We're really glad to have you, my friend. We always get started by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about their career and uh, what you do now. So uh, why don't you uh, do that for our audience? So I have the fortunate pleasure of having my foot in the world of academia as a professor, as uh, Stupak so, so graciously offered up in the intro, uh, but also have my foot in the world of, of, of practice uh, as a marketer, as an advertiser. Um, and you know, I feel like it's my job to sort of bridge the academic practitioner gap, take these things that we rigorously interrogate as as scholars and apply it to the world as as people who create interventions, who touch it, who push it, who poke at things and make things move. This was not an enterprise that I had set out for for myself, not by any stretch. I'm from Detroit, born and raised. Um, went to uh, went to University of Michigan to study engineering because I did well in math and science in high school. In those days, in the 90s, if you did well in math and science, you were black, you're going to be an engineer, full stop. So that's what I did. I went into engineering, realized that it wasn't quite for me in my first year. I thought I thought it was interesting. I just wasn't interested, if that makes any sense. And I remember going home and say, hey, mom and dad, look, you know, I, I think engineering is cool. I just don't think it's for me. And my mother's an academic. She goes, wait to get into your major. You'll love it. You'll love it. I go, okay, you know, I trust her. You know, she's done this before, you know. So I go back to school and I didn't love it. Shocker. Um, and I ended up taking some music theory courses just to offset what was a, a terrible GPA, like a failing GPA. And I fell in love with major sevens. I, mean, I played piano in church, so it was familiar, but it felt new and novel. Like I never knew much about like the pedagogy of music, like modal mixtures and things of that nature, mind blown. And I go home that summer, say, mom and dad, I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. They go out with it. I want to be a songwriter. They go, oh, no, you don't. That is not true. Uh, so I went back to school to finish my engineering degree. And when I graduated from undergrad, I went straight to the music business. And I was writing love songs for a living. I wasn't terribly successful. But I had like some some little hints of, of of glimmers of success here and there, but nothing sustainable. So I went back to school to my MBA to study marketing, particularly focusing on the world of digital, um, and and using music as sort of the 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 vehicle by which those two things intersected, which got me to Apple, then to Beyonce, um, and then in the world in the world of advertising, I think the biggest inflection point for me. Uh, was finding myself at a place called Translation. It's actually where Stupak and I, and, and I met um, writing social there because we 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 often use this word like culture. Or, you know, we you know brands lead culture more successful than those who follow, and you know get your ideas out in the culture. And I was like, wow, this is fat. This is great. You know, and though I didn't understand what it meant, I knew the vibes. I knew what it felt like. You know, and for me, I think everyone in the organization. I think that like that intuition is sort of what we all we all found ourselves uh, uh, in lockstep with, and that's kind of what we drove forward on. But as I 
began to to sort of drift into the world of social sciences, they just required a greater level of rigor with regards to the constructs, the language that we use. Um, and 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 it began to force me to question, not question, but to interrogate how we talk about what we do and actually what we do and what are we in service of and for whom are we in service of and who are we ignoring and forgetting and what we do. And that level of, 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 of introspection of inventory really fueled me. It challenged me and it fueled me, which got me into the road of academia. And, and as you know, Elaine Bennett says, yada, 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 here I am. <laughs> and we're so glad. I, I, I didn't realize that you'd written love songs. I guess I've seen some photos of you with a guitar. Um, so just remind me at the end of this, we'll have you play us out. <laughs> It'll be I better than our days. usual uh, our usual music, right? Nothing <laughs> better than our usual music. It's time for question one. Um, so I want to just start with question one, um, going back to the, the basics of what you were saying about brands following culture and actually understanding culture. What's the difference between brands that keep up with trends versus mm -hmm. that keep up with culture? Yeah, yeah. So trends are the external expressions of cultural subscription or said differently, trends are outward expressions of inward beliefs. And culture is the governing operating system by which those trends manifest. So, so what does that mean? Um, I look at culture through the lens of sociology is where most of my literature sits. Um, and the founding fathers of sociology, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, Durkheim in particular, talks about culture as a system of conventions and expectations that demarcate who we are and govern what people like us do. Right? It's a system of, 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 of sort of behaviors, artifacts, language, beliefs, and ideologies that sort of separate who we are in the world and give us space to exist with a set of expected and acceptable uh, uh, outcomes or, or practices that we engage in. So by that definition alone, you know, then the trends that we observe, what people wear, wh where they're eating, where they're going, what they're driving, what they're using, what they're doing, how they're navigating the world and the production they use to communicate and express themselves. These are all outward expressions of their identity subscription of culture. So culture is the antecedent and all things that we observe are just expressions of that. And that's where I think trend watching uh, falls short mm -hmm. because we typically study quote unquote culture, culture by observing trends. What are people wearing? Where are they going? Blah, blah, blah. And then those things are important. Don't get me wrong. Um, but these things are, 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 are merely symptoms of something far greater. They're what we do. But when we're studying culture, we're looking at why we do it. Like trends are in search of popularity, where culture is in search of meaning. And meaning, meaning is really sort of the, uh, the, the apparatus by which culture navigates the way we, or culture informs the way we navigate the world. Culture is a meaning-making system. That's why for some, a cow is leather, for others, a deity, and for some, it's dinner. But which one is it? It's all those things, depending on who you are. And therefore, whether you eat a cow, whether you wear a cow, or whether you worship a cow, those are all expressions of inward beliefs. There. I'm a two out of three on that cow. <laughs> I wonder which one you are not. <laughs> that was uh, an incredible answer. I feel like I've learned so much already, um, which is leading me to my next question. Or actually, my only question, because uh, it's my turn. It's time for question two. Obviously, you've had... Uh, incredible success, you know, on the marketing side, particularly in social with some of the biggest brands, some of the biggest personalities. What led you to academia? Mm. It was uh, what I refer to as my, a Jerry Maguire moment. I'm, I'm running social at you know, arguably, I say arguably, one of the hottest agencies in in, in the country, right? It's the work we were doing was so, was so relevant, but avant-garde at the same time. It captured the zeitgeist so perfectly while also being ahead of the curve. Um, and I'm running social at this place. Like, look at me. Like, I don't belong here. What's going on? It's amazing. Uh, 
And I'm at dinner with my then fiance, now wife, and one of her friends post college, who's a social worker. And at dinner, her friends like, you know, in social we do this, in social we do that, in social we do this, in social we do that. And I keep asking myself, why does she keep saying that? Because that's exactly what I say. Now, Stu Pack and I have been in many pitches when I say, in television you do this, but in social you do that, in radio you do this, in social you do that. And I'm like, oh, because socialist people, <laughs> duh, socialist people, social work, social justice, social action, social welfare, it's all people. And in that moment, Michael, I had like this moment of euphoria. And I was like, oh my goodness, I like the world just opened up, like the aperture just expanded so wide. And that moment went from euphoria to complete dread because I knew nothing about people, nothing. I only, only what I've known anecdotally, and I knew the phrase like Freudian slip, that's it. Like I took one sociology course my freshman year, my first semester freshman year of, of college and I slept through it. And I'm, I'm not afraid, ashamed to say that. Uh, now I teach it. I'm kicking myself okay. years later. <laughs> <laughs> When they, kick, people sleep through your class now, they're gonna they're gonna call this up and they're gonna be like, "Look!" But here's the thing: I kick myself for doing that decades later. So what went from you know this like excitement, this zeal, turned immediately into dread because I knew in that moment that I'm gonna get fired. I got me fired, and it's like here I am supposed to be the thought leader of social in the building. And I don't know, I'm looking at the world of social through a peephole. I don't know anything about what this thing really is. And the, the uh, I guess the comical part, uh, the dark comical part of this is that I had a slide in my deck that said social is about people. And then I had, then I go into all the, what the all the technology does. Um, so I, I remember being, going home after dinner and, t and I kind of confessing to my wife that like, I'm a fraud. And she goes, well, won't you start reading then? Like read social sciences. Then I like, start reading about this stuff. And I was like, I don't read books, woman. I read articles, like just stupid. And she says, look, here's a, here's a book that my friend wrote. His name is Dan Ariely. Dan Ariely, as we know him now, is the face of behavioral economics, right? He's the public face of behavioral economics. Um, and he wrote this book called Predictably Irrational. And so I read it and it rang a bell I couldn't unring. It like, it, it literally changed my life. Now I know Dan now. And every time I talk to him, I'm like, dude, you changed my life. You don't understand. It literally changed my life because it forced me to see the world in ways I never had before. And when I saw the world differently, the world manifested differently. And that began my journey of exploring the social sciences. And, and as I, and this, the beautiful part about this is that as the closer I got to it, the more I understood it, the better the work got like infinitely better. And, you know, Stupak can attest to this. I mean, I would go on and on and on. Let me talk about network theory. Let me tell you about, uh, let me tell you about all these, the, the, these concepts that we know uh, about human behavior and how it's going to drive consumption in one way or the other. And, you know, people wouldn't suffer me. They'd be like, look, dude, you're writing the strategy. You got 10 slides. That's it. We don't want to hear nothing. We don't hear, we only hear a lesson about collective effervescence. Like, please just set up the creative and shut up, you know? So I felt like I need another outlet because I was just, my curiosity was insatiable. So I needed another outlet to explore this and to, you know, have discourse about it. And I figured the classroom would probably be a good way to do it. And, you know, and, and even that got me better at my job because I, I learned how to articulate the, these ideas in ways that, you know, a novice can understand it, but even more so can actually apply it to the work. It's time for question three. Wee -hee. I'm going to look back a little bit and uh, ask about one of the more infamous marketing controversies in mm -hmm. recent times, um, Bud Light's handling of the reaction to its association with Dylan Mulvaney, um, obviously a trans uh, personality who they did you know one can for and and got got nailed to the wall by everyone about it. Uh, and then what they did in response, you know, obviously, uh, maybe the wrong thing. Uh, so what what did they misunderstand about culture that led to that plummeting popularity? And how can brands navigate culture when there's such a such such different subcultures that they all have to, you know, talk to? Um, I will never get tired of talking about this story. 
Uh, yeah. it, it's it is it is exemplar. It's a case study. It's a masterclass of how to fumble the bag. Here's a brand um, that was able to engage into a social topic, a cultural topic, but not because it was of the time. But here's a brand who had decades of receipts of being a part of this community. So if anyone ever said, oh, this is just you kind of jumping in on on, on Pride Month, they're like, are you kidding me? We've been supporting this, this, this group of people forever. I personally did uh, did uh, uh, marriage equality work for Bud Light. And the VP of the brand looked at me in the face at the time and said, this community matters to us because they supported us. So we're going to support them. And I was like, okay. And when I saw the, the campaign come out with Dylan Mulvaney, and I was like, of course, Bud Light would do this. Like, of course, yeah, this is this has been a part of the playbook at least since 2012, 2013, when I worked on the brand, 1,000%. But the minute that there was backlash, the minute that there was resistance, they flinched. And what that means is that Bud Light was only about it because it was convenient. And that is to support this community was convenient for the brand but they weren't convicted. Mm. So they flinch and the LGBTQ plus community goes, dude, I, th I thought you were rocking with us. What? So now they feel alienated and by sort of distancing themselves from the community, it doesn't make the boycotters feel like, all right, Bud Light, you're fine. They're like, we still hate you. So now Bud Light finds themselves in the messy middle. Mm. They're two polar sides and then it's just the middle. And what we know of the middle is that the middle is normal, right? We look at the, the normal curve that we know, right? Everything in the middle is normal. And there's social forces pushing on us, telling us to be normal. Those social forces is culture. And the more the middle you are, the more you are aligned with popular culture, what is normal. Now, what do we know about popular culture? Is that those forces pushing on you to be normal essentially is de-incentivizing you to be socially deviant or said differently from a commercial perspective, these people aren't going to be the first people to buy anything. They're not going to watch, listen to your album first. They're not going to download your, 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 your podcast. They're not going to watch your movie. They're not going to buy your product. They look and see what everybody else is doing. They, they, their actual strategy is risk aversion. So by Bud Light saying that, hey, these guys are upset with us. We distance ourselves from those guys. Let's just focus on the middle because that's where everyone is. We'll just say, hey, Bud Light's about good times. The people in the middle go, I don't want none of that smoke. I just drink Modelo. And as a result, sales drop. So what, what does the Bud Light case study tell us about culture? Is that culture is not cosplay. It's not meant for a theatrical performance or a limited, a limited show. People's culture is their identity, mm -hmm. and, it, and it is how they demarcate who they are in the world and govern what is normal, what is what, 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 how the world manifests in their mind, and therefore how they behave. To play in people's culture is essentially to play in their personhood. And when we engage in people's culture and then decide, ooh, 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 this is too hot for us, then of course there's going to be backlash. Right. So the, the idea is to move from a place of convenience to a place of conviction. And if you are convicted, then you need to stand when no one else is standing. That's what conviction is all about. It literally is to yeah. stand for something. Con being convicted is that when I, even if I'm the only one, even if it means I'm going to lose every single customer, I do this because I believe in it. And the truth is, but like didn't believe in it. That's what Nike did with, with I was their, just going to say you know, that. Yeah, just gonna say that. What would you have? Not what would happening. you have recommended they actually do uh, in the moment of that when they got so, the the response? So, my first instinct would have I would have been like, pull their seats. Like, where were y'all when we did this? Where were y'all when we did that? And oh, by the way, Kid Rock, you're shooting up cans of of Bud Light. We got a picture of you drinking a Bud Light right next to a drag queen. What, what, what was the deal? What What are we talking about here? Like, please help me understand it. And. It, it, and without even sort of making any allegations, without calling anyone out, it's just begging. It's just begging the question: Why is this a problem now when it wasn't a problem 
just five years ago, just four years ago, mm. just a year ago. And you mm. now invite the discourse to say, hey, can we actually someone please put these people in check? Because I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be aggressive about it. You don't have to be like, hey, you guys are wrong. And here's why you just have to be like, this is not abnormal for us. This is what we do. And we are. And what I love about the Bud brand, and I think they should bring back uh, this Bud's for you, because I think it's one of the greatest taglines of all time, because what you say about culture is uh, my culture is my culture. Your culture is your culture. This person's cu like it's for you, whoever you are, wherever you are, it's for you. Um, I just I think they yeah, they fumbled the bag on on that whole brand. Right thousand percent uh this has been three tiny questions from Stu pack and two tiny questions from mike and tom uh also known as three tiny questions with dr marcus collins a tremendous tiny thanks to him tiny golf clap there uh we are your hosts the tiny team of tom chrisman mike robner and michael Stu pack you can check out our agency at tinyadagency.com and see us provoking big ideas and belly laughs all over your LinkedIn feeds. Tune in next time for more three tiny questions and send us your biggest marketing questions here in our feed and you could find yourself featured here. Stay tiny, everyone. Stay, Stay tiny. tiny. How'd I do? How'd I do? You did great. Uh, you that guys was one great. of your best performances, I think. Thank you. This was terrific, so y'all. I had so much fun. Mm -hmm.